Frank, welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. No worries, man. How you been? Yeah, good. You? Yeah, good, man. Good. Uh, so before we get you back, because obviously we've got to know you a little bit more recently, and I think a lot of the jiu-jitsu scene in the UK would have seen you running through the competitions. They'll be a little bit familiar with, obviously, the, the kind of situation with yourself and Sam Crook. Um, but I think not many people would probably know the full extent of your background and obviously how you ended up in the UK. So that's what we thought we talked to you about today. So obviously you grew up in Cameroon. Tell us about your upbringing. So before I met Sam, I'd been living with my, my aunt. And then I, so I'd been living with my aunt and uh, my brother, my cousin and sister and stuff. And I never met my dad, really. And then I, the first time I met my dad was like at my mom's funeral. I was 12 years old. And then two years after that, that's when I met Sam. So why, why didn't you ever meet your dad? Did you just not want anything to do? Was that? I don't know. I never met him because I don't know who he was. Like, my mom never like showed me that, that there is your dad or stuff like that. No. She was just saying stuff like, oh, he never want to know like uh, a, lot, uh, a lot about you. He just like, don't want to know who I am. Fucking hell. That's a bit shit, isn't it? I met Sam two years after my mom's funeral. Mm, okay. So what age were you then? So what age were you, like 15, 14, 15? Uh, I was 14. 14, 14 okay. yeah, when I met Sam. Yeah, so what was your situation to all that, that age? Were you living with your auntie, you say? So I was living with her. We was, we was like quite poor at that time. Like, we're not rich now, so <laughs> we're still poor. And I was working in the farm, going to school and trying to play football at that time. So I was like going to school, come back, come back from school, working at the chopping wood, Carrying water and then go to play football. Okay. My aunt, my aunt take care of me since I was three years old. So my mom left me with my aunt to go in the city, trying to like find some money and give to my aunt to help me like for school fees and other stuff. So I was living with her since I was like three. And so I was uh, something like 16. Mm -hmm. Then I started living with Sam. Yeah, okay. And then before Sam arrived, you said you were obviously playing a bit of football. Were you doing much sport or was it just, was it just football? Uh, just football. I, I, like, I like sport, but I was just, at that time I was just like playing football and like trying to be a professional football player. But in Cameroon, it's quite hard to play football without, without money. So everything in Cameroon is money, basically. Yeah. What position did you play? Uh, striker. <laughs> <laughs> did they have like a local team there? Yeah, it's some local team there. Like, not a lot. Like now, Francis started like a a big local team there. I seen him in a football kit when he yeah. not too long ago, like smashing it. <laughs> Is he any good? Have you played with him? I never really see him like playing. So big fucking lump, and he can't so. say he's good. Though. <laughs> <laughs> so growing up, obviously in the in the sort of town you were in, like obviously Francis created the foundation um, which is what brought Sam over I mean what was your kind of awareness of Francis at that point did you follow his career like did you did you actually know him yeah I didn't know him like really well like talk with him I never really like talk with Francis much so at that time I just know who he was and what he was doing out there going out there and fighting stuff like that so I didn't I like, really know much about him so I just know Francis is like a champion he's uh, fighting MMA he's from same village as me so I didn't know like really much about him hey guys just letting you know that we recently launched our new everyday black belt membership on patreon this gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them you also get exclusive content as well as early ad free access to all of our episodes so if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us, it supports the channel, and it helps us bring you better guests. And did you kind of understand much about mixed martial arts and jiu-jitsu or anything at that point? Um, not really before I started to... Uh, not really before I started jiu-jitsu. At that time, I just know like... Mm, karate, judo, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know what jiu-jitsu was. I didn't know what like kickboxing, martial art. I didn't know stuff like that. Just like no karate and jitsu. Mm -hmm. And some couple of stuff I saw on TV, like some Kung Fu, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there wasn't much of a uh, martial art scene in Cameroon then, or certainly where you were from? Uh, so before the foundation was like, I don't think so, because I never like 
seen people doing judo or karate. I've just seen that on the TV and like hear about that. So I don't think it was something like karate or judo in the village before the foundation. Fair enough. And then obviously Francis set up the foundation. Um, was that something you were kind of aware was happening before it actually happened? Mm, not really. At that time, I was like, just like focused on the football and I was not really like looking forward to do like martial art at one point. I was just like trying to be like professional football player. And then one day my aunt said to me, oh, Francis said to me, he's going to open the foundation and one white guy going to work there. <laughs> <laughs> and she said like, maybe you need to give it a go and see how, how you get on. I said, yeah, I'll go there and have some fun. And then I went there the first day I saw Sam and like, I say hi, he say hi, and then he asked my name and like that. I went there, it was quite fun for the first day. I was like, just trying to enjoy. Yeah. Just trying to enjoy what he's doing and trying to like pay attention and trying to learn something instead of just messing around. So what was your uh, first impression of this like tall, blonde, strange white man that just arrived <laughs> in the village? <laughs> so like, he was not talking much at that time, so was just like, oh, the first time I met him was just like, oh, he just know, like, he just knew no two words in French, like, salut, comment tu t'appelles? <laughs> that mean like, hello, what's your name? <laughs> right. So he just know that two word and in French. So he said, he said that to me, hello, what's your name? I say, my name is fine. He say, uh, I'm Sam, enchanté. <laughs> and then he was not talking much. He was just like teaching and just like, taking care of other kids too, like helping people, doing good stuff in the village. And after a couple of times, I started like training like, because at that time I was just training like one or two per week. So I start like training three per week, four per week. That's when, that's when we start talking much together because I was there like all the time. Do you remember like the very first class and what, what was taught? Yeah, my first class in G2, uh, Sam taught me uh, the truck. Okay. They took like some kind of berembolo thing on <laughs> <laughs> my first day. <laughs> so not, not like shrimping, not no, like no. facing positions. Something cool to get you all hooked. Yeah. Yeah. I like it, yeah. Because it's quite fun. Like he was trying to like make make us like what we're we doing. So yeah, yeah. So it's quite in, a, fun, a, a fun choke, position. Yeah. yeah. So first day I was, I was with my cousin and then he teach us how to do the truck truck position so he was rolling around rolling around like it was quite fun i really enjoyed Class. that that day and was that what kind of kept you coming back that it was fun or did you potentially see that there could be like a future in jiu-jitsu for you uh not really that time like the first uh three months i was just like going there for fun and like have somewhere to talk with people because since my my mom passed away i was like quite on my own like i was just a little bit nervous all the time like stuff like that but when i went there for the first time was other kids from the village so we was talking around met some new friends stuff like that so it was quite fun so for the first three months i was just, i was just there like mm, trying to have some fun and make some fun and obviously you know we we talk a lot about the camaraderie which means like the sort of the almost like the team team sort of spirit of jiu-jitsu and compared to other sports, it seems to be more obvious. Did you find that when you thought about like playing football versus jiu-jitsu, did you find that you made better friends in jiu-jitsu? Uh, yeah, because like football, everyone is trying like to be the best in his uh, manhood. Yes. Like, but in jiu-jitsu, you like working together, you need to draw something with someone like talking, explain yourself, like explain the technique to your friend if he's not understanding what is going on. So stuff like that then you're getting on like talking much with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I think you're making better friends in G2 than other sports. I always think with football, it, even though it's a team sport, it's such an individual team sport. Yeah, Everyone's yeah. like looking yeah. out for themselves. Whereas jujitsu, if your training partner's getting better, you're going to get better. So it's, it benefits both of you to get better, you know? And whereas football, you're kind of always looking to like do one over. You know what I mean? If I score more goals <laughs> than the other striker, I'm fucking playing, I'm getting, going to a better team. It's true, isn't it? You know yeah, what I mean? It's true, it's true, yeah. So it's, 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 yeah, it's a bit of a different paradigm. Yeah, so so th did you did you find that like after a while that the all the guys doing jiu-jitsu become like a little bit of a family? Yeah, yeah, like before uh, was like 
everyone like was just on his own and then when we started to train at the foundation so it was quite like a family after a couple of years because he was training every day like with uh, with like loads of people he was like a family because we train with them every day we're talking with them every day we like together every day at the foundation so we was quite like a family then of a team yeah that's awesome man and you mentioned earlier obviously you eventually ended up living with sam Tell us how that happened, because obviously meeting this this sort of uh, this new, this new guy in the village for the first time <laughs> can barely speak any French. Like, how did you go from like there to then actually living with him? So it's quite a long story, though. So take your time, man. I was uh, like I said before, I was training like one per week, two per week, and then I started to train like five times a week, like seven times a week. So that's how we start like talking with uh, each other like much. So before we was not like talking so much. And then after he didn't even know I don't have a parent. So when I start spending time with him, I explain, I explain my situation. I say, uh, my mom passed away two years ago and then I never met my dad, stuff like that. I met him like in my mom's funeral. So I start talking with him, stuff like that. And he start helping me with stuff like with food, after training, he take me to the shop, give us some food with me and my friends, stuff like that. And then we start like, I, I, he, asked, he asked me what I'm doing when I get, I'm going back home. He, I'm saying nothing, I'm just going and lie down and sleep. He said, oh, maybe you guys can come down my, in my house and watch some film, stuff like that. Yeah, we start going down there, watch some film with other guys, stuff like that. And we start spending more time in the day too, like, Sometimes I will like in the morning, normally I don't train in the morning, but sometimes in the morning I will skip school and say to some like, oh no, no, I don't have school today. But I skip school and then I'll just, just, just that because I want to spend day with him and then train. So I was like <laughs> skipping school and go in the foundation and train with him and then go and eat something in the lunchtime, go back uh, home, watch some film, go back after and train again. Then I'll go back down with him, watch some film again and then, go back home <laughs> living the dream basically yeah so it was like that like i start to go at his house like four times a week like i start like let's say in one week i start to go there like one per week and then after two per week like three per week i ask him like please can you call my aunt and say i'm with you because my aunt is like she loves me so much and if i'm not home at like in certain times she's gonna start worrying like where is fun where is fun and Stuff like that. So I asked him, please, can you call my aunt and say, I'm with you, I'm, I'm with you. So like that, I start spending like loads of evening there, like go back, like at like something like 11, 12. And then after I asked him like, oh, please, can you call my aunt and say I'll sleep here? For like the first time he said, mm, yeah. And then he called my aunt, he said, fine, I'm gonna sleep here today because we like a bit late and then I'm tired to drop him home. She said, oh no, yeah, it's fine. And then like that, I start sleep there like two times a week, three times a week, four times a week. And then after I was sleeping there like seven, seven times a week. So that's how I get, I start like li live with him like every day. And then after in the morning, he gonna like drop me at my aunt's house. And then I gonna help her to chop the wood, carry water, and then help her to make ra ra meat. Okay. So my, my aunt, she's selling rat meat in the village on the street. So I used to like help her to like, because to make a raw meat, you need to burn them. You need to burn. So I used to help her burn, remove stuff from the stomach, and then she's gonna cut them and make for the next day. So, sorry, Frank, are you saying white meat or rat meat? Rat meat. Rat, rat meat. Yeah, rat rat meat. Rat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> God, fucking hell. What's a bit of rat taste like? <laughs> mm, it's quite good, actually. I like it. Dear. <laughs> How big are the rats? They're like this big. Jesus. And you used to sell that, did you? Yeah. So I used to sell that on the street, like with a rat on my head in the, <laughs> in the, in the, in the pot. And then like start shouting to people, rat me, rat me, rat me. And then they're going to like buy. Like it's one, it's one for mm, 500, 500 francs is like something like 60p. And if in, in Cameroon, it's quite money, so one for five, five, five hundred fines. It's like where the fuck are you getting these rats? 
Um, but you hunting them down you, yourself? Is, is this what you Not want to do? Do you have a rat farm? Do you have a rat farm? Like, <laughs> you have a rat Scoping farms? around, yeah. yeah. rat farms, is that what you were farming? Just giant rats? No, so it's like, it's other people's job, so to like just hunting one other stuff and Fuck then after off. they're going to sell that to like two pounds. <sighs> That's mad. And from what age were you selling these rats? Mm, maybe since I was seven. That's insane. It's so different yeah. to like... My boy is, is 12 and he's such a little princess. You know what I mean? He's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's at home now on his boxes playing FIFA with Alanis Morissette on. <laughs> <laughs> In Cameroon, you have to go to farm. Yeah, right? mate. Yeah, that's it. insane. Okay. Even just to go to school, you have to do that. That's, yeah, that's another that's world, isn't it? Wild. That's why like, kids from Africa is like quite strong than kids in UK and in Europe. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, because they're like used to like work hard in the farm, chopping wood, carrying water. That's why it they It gives like, you a stronger mentality, yeah. doesn't it? Even even when me and Paul was growing up, it's different to what it is now. You know what I mean? It was a lot rougher then. It's a lot, It's kids now, it's so easy, isn't it? You know, they don't go out, they don't really do anything, you know, apart from playing Xbox. Yeah, yeah. That explains uh, why you're so fucking strong and quick on the mats, mate, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck it out. And what was your, uh, thinking back to like that time, like sort of obviously doing jiu-jitsu, Sam was in the village, what was like your funniest memory? Mm. I imagine it was probably one of Sam's pronunciations, but you know, something to that effect. <laughs> so it was uh, in Christmas and then like, we were so like, like in family. So we was like living like a family, everyone in the foundation. So it was Christmas, everyone was in Sam's house, like for the party and because he 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 killed a pig and he was <laughs> Who killed a pig? Me. You killed um, a pig? Yes. <laughs> what, like a big boar? Because I've seen some big fucking Turkish boar, all right? <laughs> yeah, like I kill I killed him with a knife. And then well, we was going to cook that for a for the party. Like everyone from the foundation was coming down to like for the party and eat the pig. So one guy was sleeping like on the sofa and then some take like two uh the two pants. pants. Yeah, two pants and then like go behind him and clap that behind <laughs> him. <laughs> he wake up and then he thought he thought it was like another little guy we uh, we live with him, deep home. And he was going he was like he get mad like, Oh what what the fuck you doing? <laughs> I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> was so funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny man and then obviously we we know that sam obviously went on to adopt you so when did that conversation come up how did that come about so at one point we start to like because i was like training every day and i was living with him like like my my father like my dad so because i never i never have a dad i never like know how someone can love someone like his son so at that point, I started like, even me, I, I start to like, feel like he's my dad. Even if he's not my real dad, mm. I, I'm taking him like my dad because he started to like, love me doing stuff like no one ever did to me, like helping me with loads of stuff. And especially when he didn't have to, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. And then, so at one point he's like, he, we said like, oh, he said to me like, oh, I want to bring you in UK to like compete and met my family there too. Because now we like a family, you like my son. I say, yeah, that should be a good idea. And then we start to like looking how to like make a passport for me, how to do a visa, how stuff like that. And then we see like was so hard. First thing we need to like find my dad to sign stuff. And then we don't even know where he was working. We don't know who he is and stuff like that. So we have to start like like looking on social media, like stuff like Facebook tap his name and then after we found his name and he uh, we found his name and we I don't know how we like look something and that thing was saying he he walking down in the city at the bus station so uh, Sam's girlfriend was uh, walking at the bus station too so uh, Sam asked his girlfriend like please can you like ask your boss if he you know this guy because they was working the same same company yeah same company but different city and then she asked her boss, her boss said, yeah, he work in Yaoundé. He work in the, the other city. So Sam, Sam and me went there and then Sam, go and ask, Sam went and asked him like, oh, I'm France coach. I want you to sign stuff for his passport. He didn't even say like, how is Frank? Where is he? Like, he's good. He just said, oh, why you want me to sign? And then he signed and then fuck off. How does that make you feel? Like, at that point, I, I was like, 
taking some like my real dad. So that didn't like make me feel so bad because I was like, yeah, it's like no one for me. So we started legal adoption because Sam was like, was not going good in the foundation and Sam was like, want to go back in UK already. So he said like, I don't want to leave you in like this kind of life again. So it was like without dad, without parents. So now if I'm with you like three years and I will leave you again, like your life is just going to be shit. So we start figuring out how we can do like to go together and we look online. He said, maybe if I adopt you, you can be legal, legally my son, then you become British. So we, that's when we start like talking about adoption and everyone in my family was like, yeah, that should that is a good idea. So we started doing like death certificate for my mom, stuff like that. But everything in Cameroon takes so long though. Like you need money, you need stuff and like it's never ending, mm -hmm. stuff like that. So we start adoption and we went to UK like for the first time. At that time we like adoption was like, in process already. So we went in UK for the first time. I compete like, I did two competitions, like so far that uh, that time was in January. So we went back in February. That's when we start like trying to do like adoption quick as possible because like we check online and they said like, if I'm 18, it's gonna be different because here, when you're 18, you add already. But in Cameroon, you like, you need to be 21. So that's why we start to like- Like rush the process. Yeah, yeah. rush the process. I was 17 at that time, so we start to rush the process, the process and stuff like that. Even now, everything is not done yet. So that's uh, just so slow. Is he is he adopted you now? Yeah. So that's yeah. all done. Yeah, it's done. So that's done. So, so everything is come on in Cameroon just take like so long and money. <laughs> just <that's laughs> it. Money and so long. So let's go back to that that first time in the UK. So obviously you'd never been on a plane or anything yeah. at this point. So <laughs> even just that, tell us what that experience was like. That was crazy. That was crazy. <laughs> yeah. You shit yourself. Right. Not really like, <laughs> I was thinking uh, I'm dreaming, really. I was thinking like, I'm gonna wake up in the morning and mm. I'm gonna be in the village. Mm. <laughs> like even the first day I was like, here, I, I was thinking like, I'm gonna wake up in the morning and then I'm gonna be in the village. So I was just dreaming. So the first time was like my first time to be in the, like literally in the airport and in the plane, stuff like that. So that was crazy. I was like, fuck, you know, that's mad. <laughs> <laughs> I never been in this place. Like when the plane was flying, I was like looking out like, fuck, you know, so we literally like flying. <laughs> I was like, yeah, so we flying. <laughs> so I was like, fuck, you know, that is like mental. So before I was like thinking like, come on airport is like so good. Like when I went inside, I was like, fuck, you know, it's like paradise in here. And then I uh, we land in UK. I was like, wait, we was in Cameroon. And then I was thinking it's like so good. UK is like way better. It's like 10 times better than Cameroon. So I was like, just lost. Like people in Cameroon think like Cameroon is like so good. But when you like travel on in, in another country, you like just thinking Cameroon is shit really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so before you even like, came to the airport, came to the UK, like what were your, what did you think the UK was gonna be like? What were you excited about coming to the UK for? I always dream like I wanna travel in other, other countries and then like, because people in Cameroon don't think other countries like that are good. They just think like, oh yeah, Cameroon is good. I wanna go in the city in Cameroon, it's like so good. So I was there like trying to like, just like, because some show me loads of pictures of place here, loads of stuff online. I was like, yeah. I literally looking forward to go there and I was like excited about that. But that take like so long to do my documents and stuff. So I was just like thinking I'm dreaming when I was flying. Mm, yeah, but in the plane, I said to Sam like, you know, in the plane when they have like TV on the chair, like there, I said to Sam like, oh, fucking watch all of those films before I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> After 15 minutes, I was there like sleeping yeah. away. <laughs> I was like so excited. Like I can't even, I was not even believing what is happening. So then when you arrived in the UK, you obviously land on the plane coming to the airport. Were there any issues like actually getting through like, immigration or anything? Uh, yeah, we was stuck in the immigration like five hours because- Five hours? Yeah, five hours in the immigration in London. So we land in London and then I was like so excited to like go out. And then we, you know, when you went, uh, you go into the immigration uh, uh, place and then they're like saying people from 
England, that side, people yeah. from other country, this side. So I went on that side and they take my passport. They see like, I was like 17. So I was not in an adult to travel on your own. So they like start like thinking Sam is trying to kidnap me <laughs> and bring me in the UK. He looks like the sort to be fair, yeah. so I don't blame him. <laughs> <laughs> was quite suspicious. So, and then I don't have a mom. So we need to, they need to like start looking, looking how, why I'm traveling with Sam, who he is, like stuff like that. So they start like calling people in Cameroon. And then because like my dad is a count, so we didn't tell him he was traveling. And then they, they said like they want to contact contact my dad and then we didn't tell him. And then they contact him like, they, don't, they didn't even talk much. So I was just like so scared at that time, like fuck, you know, they were saying like they're gonna send me back in Cameroon. I was like, so I travel in the in the plane, I get here and then you tell, you're tell telling me you're gonna send me back to Cameroon, <laughs> oh, no you mad. <laughs> I was just like so scared. And after five hours, they're like, they called me in the office, just me on my own, talking with me, asking me like, who is Sam? Why I'm traveling with him, stuff like that. Where is my family? And then after they called Sam again in the office and like asking loads of questions, stuff like that. And then after they realized was like, was truth what we were, uh, Sam and me was saying like, he's my coach, he, uh, he's he's adopting me and stuff like that. So they, they let us, they let us uh, go through. Yeah, girl, that's mad, isn't it? It's crazy. <laughs> Well, glad you made it in, mate. Um, so obviously you came and competed. So talk to us, tell us about your first competition and what that was like. Ah, so my first competition was like, was loads of pressure on me, like, because everyone in Cameroon was like, oh yeah, he gonna smash people there, but people here train too. So it's like hard to like, you think you're just gonna come here and like beat people easily, but they train too, they're like on the mat seven days a week. So same as you. So it was quite hard. I like, I I did how many fights I did on that in that competition? Like something like six six fights, and I win all of them in the final. I did the final against someone. Uh, someone he's quite good for a blue belt. So I was blue belt at that time. He's quite good for a blue belt. Was that match was like nil nil, and he was winning two two nil, and to last uh, fifteen seconds. Some said to me like, "You want to win this fight or you want to lose?" get get back up and double leg like him <laughs> it was like 15 seconds left he said get back up there and double leg like him because we went like it was in the scramble and we went out of the mat so the ref stopped the match and sam was talking to me he said like you want to win this match or you want to lose go in there and like double leg like him straight away i said okay so we went in with tap hands and i double leg like him straight away and knee on belly so it was like <laughs> four two for me and then it was uh, the end of the match i was like I can't believe I made it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet your mate was fucking gutted when he 15 yeah. seconds. I was like so happy at that time. I was like just thinking I'm still dreaming because travel, getting UK, something like I was not like thinking is ever going to happen. Like travel, compete, win the competition, have a belt, stuff like that. Like I was like just thinking I'm dreaming. Mm, amazing. And then how long were you in the UK for on that occasion? Uh, six weeks. Six weeks. In, six weeks, yeah. And how many competitions did you have? Would you say it was uh, a couple? Just two. two. Just two. Because I was just there for like, like met the family, mm. have time with family here mm. and stuff like that. So we just like did two competitions. Yeah, yeah. And how did you, uh, how was meeting Sam's family for the first time? Uh, was actually good. Everyone was like taking care of me, like especially his nan. His nan. <laughs> I love his nan. She's so, <laughs> she's so good. Uh, so I was like, Everyone was good. I, I like his family. They're like really good. They're taking care of me like their own family too. So stuff like that. Yeah, I like his family really good. Yeah, nice. And then obviously you went back to Cameroon and pr before coming to England, like you said, you were a little bit ignorant. You didn't really know what it was really like here, but now you know. So then getting back to Cameroon, like how did that feel? Uh, get, going back to Cameroon, I was like looking forward to see my family first. And then when I get in this, when I, get back in the city. So we travel from uh, London to uh, the capital in Cameroon. So I get out the cap I get out the, the airport. I was like, shit. <laughs> now I'm, I can see the difference. Like, like England is way, way better than Cameroon. So the capital of England, London and the capital of, uh, of the Cameroon is like different. It's like, if Cameroon want to be like London, it's going to be like 100 years. 
yeah, before before they like London, yeah. um, for sure, yes. even thousand years. Like, <clears throat> so it's nothing, nothing is working there. So you just in the traffic for like fucking three hours because it's no no one is respecting traffic light. So it's, it's <laughs> red, everyone is going full. It's green, everyone is going full. So it's like, when it's red, everyone is just going full. That's why it's like, it's traffic everywhere, it's motorbike, like everywhere you don't need to wear helmet, stuff like that. Like it's accident there every day, all the time, stuff like that. And it's just so shit there. So other than the traffic, like what else like do you think makes like the UK or London specifically better than the capital of Cameroon? Even just like people, the mentally of people, like, they're not thinking the same way people here is thinking. Why, why do you think that is so? People, they just like like money so much and like just thinking about their self. They're not like thinking about the country, about the place. They're not thinking about nothing like that. So they're not thinking about like how we're going to like make like come on better. How we're going to like, they're just thinking about their own self. Like everyone's in like survival mode. Yeah. And stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously go back to the village. Obviously saw everybody celebrated and then kind of where was your head at like were you keen to get straight back to the uk or did you want to stay for a bit did you even like what was the plan at that point did you know you were coming back to the uk again yeah so our plan at that point was like to come back in uk and compete like as much we can so i start like do like a hard training camp there because i know my performance was not like that so so good uh for my first competition so we went back and we, we start like work hard like running every day lifting weight like training in the morning training in the evening stuff like that like it was training really hard at that time preparing for the next time we're going to travel so that was the, the plan for, that was the plan when we when we go back uh, in Cameroon mm -hmm. so we were trying to like finish the adoption and like travel again mm -hmm. and was there ever any doubt that it wouldn't happen yeah the only the only problem was like the visa and stuff uh, like stuff takes so long in Cameroon to like <clears throat> work. So I was just worrying like about about the visa at that time, like because we trying to make we made it the first time it was like like something like five months mm -hmm. before you get your visa stuff like that. And then I was just like worrying maybe we not they're not gonna give me the visa for the next time. Like why he wanna travel like have a, another visa after another one. So I was just worrying about the visa at that time. Yeah. And you're, you're kind of like your friends and the, the other kids and, and lads from the jiu-jitsu school. Well, obviously you've had an amazing opportunity that they didn't. I mean, what, what was what was their kind of attitude towards you? Like, were they supportive or were they a little bit jealous? You know, that's what I was talking about. Like, people in Cameroon is not like, they're not like thinking like people in Europe or people in US, stuff like that. So they're just there like, they're saying, why not me? Why not me? Like, they're just like jealous. Some people is like, not like that some people is thinking like people here like but like 80 percent of people in Cameroon is like just jealous and don't want you to like move up so before you was like same level as them now you move up they don't want that so they want you to go back down and stay same level with them mm, okay and like how's that like now you've obviously come to the uk are you still in touch with many of them or have you just not Mm, yeah, I'm still talking with like loads of people in Cameroon, okay. loads of like friends from Jiu Jitsu there. They're still like, a couple of, the, couple of them still like training there, but like most of them stopped training since uh, Sam and me left. Yeah, cool. And then just before we kind of like move on, I guess, to you coming to the UK for a longer period, what are your thoughts on the whole Francis and Ganu Foundation? Like what, like what Francis did for, for you in the village, providing that facility and obviously bringing Sam over? Yeah, I, I like was really good because I didn't even know who he was. At that time, I, I was like, I know he, he gave me the chance well, uh, by opening the foundation and by bringing some Cameroon. So yeah, I know that. But it's just like something like he opened the foundation and he don't want to like make other, uh, give people chance to like go out there and show what you can do to people. So he just want to want, like, use people after so he opened the foundation and he don't want to like give chance to like other kids there some ask him if uh, if he can find a sponsor to like help kids there to travel and like do something like worlds euros but francis refused mm, okay so lucky sam did what he did then huh 
<laughs> okay, so obviously got the visa sorted and then second time in the airport, second time on the plane. This time arriving, were there any issues with immigration on the second occasion or was it a bit no, smoother? that was like quick, like one minute. So. Yeah, nice. I bet you were so fucking yeah, relieved I when you're going through like, like oh. <laughs> <laughs> go through this again. Because at that time I was still like 17, was like four days before my, my was nine days before my birthday. Uh -huh. So I was going to be 18 in nine days. So I give him my passport. He just like look for it and then give me back and say, you're welcome. We can go for. I was like so happy, like wow, yeah. it's impressive. <laughs> because <laughs> last time we did like five hours in the immigration, and then this time like one minute he checked my visa, my visa, my passport, and just let me through. Oh, he must like, been buzzing with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I did have problem in Cameroon, so uh, they refused to let uh, let us in the plane because we didn't have a return flight. So and then we paid a guy. He he did like he booked a fake flight, something like that, a fake flight. And then they let us in the plane. Now, in the way that I, um, we have a problem again because I, I didn't have a yellow fever, yellow fever thing. Certificate. Yeah, yellow fever certificate. And then we paid that woman again and then she let us go. <laughs> <What laughs> so, the fuck? Cameroon is How just much like. How much Is it like a lot? Uh, in Cameroon, is a lot. It's like 10 pounds. Right, okay. Then but yeah, for so the other guy, it was like something like 30 pounds. It's fucking so corrupt, isn't it? It's crazy, well, isn't it? Yeah, it's that, like mate. crazy. Yeah, yeah. loads of rats. <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell. <laughs> I'm a rat pie. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So obviously you were eight, turned 18 in the UK. How did you celebrate? Uh, yeah. Loads of shots. <laughs> had, you, had you drank much alcohol like beforehand? Is there much of a, is there much of a drinking culture in, uh, in, in Cameroon? Cameroon? Um, yeah, lots of people drink there, but not like people in UK. Like they can be <laughs> drinking like all day, but they're not like like really drunk. Like here in UK, people just drink like like in one in one hour you like fucked up. Yeah, we we binge, <laughs> mate. Cameroon, we binge like, as much as we can yeah, really quick. Yeah, then in Cameroon you like taking time. You like you can drink like one beer in like thirty minutes and stuff like that. Another one, another one. So. But here in UK, it's like quick, 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 quick. Yeah. And then after you fucked up. <laughs> yeah. So you had uh, lots of shots on your birthday. Yeah, vodka. Nice. Okay. How was the hangover? So we went in, we went in uh, all you can eat Chinese. And then I couldn't eat because I did like loads of shots already. And then I ate one plate and then I threw up. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if you couldn't eat, you must have been really unwell. Man. Yeah. Okay, so. Yeah. You love a fucking <laughs> bit of grub. Yeah. <laughs> so you're now in the UK and... For how long were you kind of expecting to be here for at this point? Did you, was it an ongoing thing or was it just a period of time? Uh, we thought it was just like a period of time, but we, we was talking with a lawyer here and they said like, no, if uh, we need to make, make that work. So um, I need to be here in UK. So if I travel back, I'm not going to be able to come here again. So I need to be here while she's working on yeah, what okay. she's working on now. So you're kind of, you're, you're basically stuck in the UK yeah. for, for yeah. now. Okay. And then sort of obviously you're here sort of an ongoing basis now and you obviously haven't been home for a while back to Cameroon. Do you miss anything about Cameroon or are you uh, just I don't really here? miss the place. I just miss my family. Yeah. I miss my family and some couple of friends, like people who I was training with them before, stuff like that. Yeah. So I don't really miss the place. Yeah. And what's your favourite thing about the UK? Favourite three things? Favourite three things? Uh, how people think? Uh... The place, the place is good. I like the place. And uh, what else? Food, right? Gotta be. Food. <laughs> and the law here. Yeah. The law? Yeah. Okay. The law. What do you mean by that? Like, stuff is strict. It's not like God, like in Cameroon. Like, because in Cameroon, you can do everything. Just pay someone and let you go through the plane and stuff like that. But here, it's not like that. Yeah. It's like, if you don't have a white paper, you stop. Yeah, it's fucking bonkers, isn't it? Because being in the UK, from the UK, you're always moaning about the law and yeah. <laughs> how annoying it is. But we don't we don't realise how far ahead we are compared to some yeah, other yeah. countries. You know, with with those types of things, we think our law is shit, but really they're by the book, and they. You know, you can't you can't well nine out of ten you can't pay, can't pay off a cop. <laughs> yeah, probably a few you know, more than that. Yeah, but. there's like so crazy with law, right? like with people stealing and like get people killed in the street. Like not like here, like someone gets stabbed, like. At least like maybe like at least every day there they're killing someone from stealing. Oh, like, really? Yeah, on the street, like burning him. Jesus, really? 
Have you seen people boom back then? Sir? Yeah, putting some tie on him. Yeah, they like, do that. I've seen that in a okay. documentary in South Africa. And they, they basically get people who steal stuff, oh, just like put them in fucking tires and, and light them on fire, don't they? Yeah, and the police not going to do nothing. Sometimes the police is even there. They like kill you, like, like beat you to death with like fucking <laughs> sticks and stuff. That's fucking insane. And you've seen this happen? Yeah, yeah, in the city. Once. Okay, oh man. How did how did you how did that make you feel? Scared. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to steal never. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is that a really bad thing in Cameroon stealing? Yeah. Because uh, yeah. again, the same sort of documentary they were saying that they 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 count stealing higher than rape. So if they if if people rape people, they kind of like give them a slap on the wrist or something like that. But if they if they steal something, they they literally get banned in tires. And I, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. So I have one friend in Cameroon who was like. That kind of people like in the city who like steal stuff from people like stole money and like like pickpocket yeah pickpocket and like bags stuff like that and then one day he did that and then people uh, people in in the city catch him and like put tires on him like put fuel trying to burn him and the police save him <laughs> like he was there like how old was he uh twenty one something like that twenty one did he have like burn marks from it or yeah, he has loads of scars on him too. Oh, fucking hell. So he actually lit the fire. Yeah. And then uh, after that, he gave up on that. And then he like, because he was in the city, he gave up and he went in the, vi- he came down in the village and trying to like train, trying to be like Francis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. God. Fucking hell. It's a different, it's just a, yeah. I mean, our, our, our pathetic problems sometimes. Yeah. Like, you're talking about, like, fuck me. Yeah. You know it's I mean? a fucking crazy world. All right. So, you obviously went on a bit of a tear on the on the jiu jitsu scene in the UK. Um, so we didn't really we know you back then, but we were obviously seeing you kind of running through the, the blue the blue belt division. So uh, talk us through that that first year of competing at blue belt. Um, it was quite like I enjoy competing first, so like I like competing because it's it's what I like to do. So I like jiu jitsu and I like competing. So that's even why what I want to do in the future: be competing, be competitor, and like win loads of. Uh, medals stuff like that so like first couple of competition i was like quite stressed like because i was not used to it like i just compete i've been doing jiu-jitsu for four years and i i before that i just compete two time like in when i was here for the first time so after that we went uh, we was here in uk again and then sam and me we have planned for like 22 competition to do and then we do all, all of them 22 yeah and then I think it was uh, 20 competition in four months. So like the first couple of five competition, I was like quite stressed because I was not used to it. Like I was just trying to like build my game and like get used to the competition. And then after that, I was quite relaxed, like just trying to enjoy what I'm doing. So it's what I like to do. So I was just on the mat there trying to enjoy what I'm doing. Before that, I was just like stressed, like, oh, I want to go home. I'm so stressed. I want to go home. Some said to me like, you need to be like, you need to enjoy being on the mat. You need to enjoy being on the mat. If you're not enjoying being on the mat, you're not going to have a good performance. So I was just going there, like, enjoying being on the mat, trying to do the best I can. Yeah, nice. And thinking about, obviously, sort of Sam's coaching and his, like, mentorship, what was, like, was there any bits of advice that he gave you around competing other than, like, enjoying the time on the mat that that really helped? Uh, Yeah, like, he gives me advice every day, like, on my game, like, when I go when I when I step on the mat, he say like, depend like who I'm fighting. If it's someone who is not like really good, he can just like say, okay, go. I know you're gonna beat that guy and do your thing. But if it's someone who is like technical, good, he's gonna say like, what is your strategy for that guy? And then like give me advice. Like I think for that guy, you need to like take him down and pass his guard. Then you can submit him from there. Or maybe if he's another guy, he can say maybe you can pull guard for that guy and then start working from there. So. When I I have a competition coming up, we like look for the look for people who is my is in my division. Then we like trying to figure out who they are, and then if it's someone who is good, we're gonna like have a strategy for him. Like he's gonna say maybe use. I think if you need to use butterfly for that guy, sweep him, and then from there you're good. You can sum him from there. So that's basically how we work in like for for all of that competition. Yeah, awesome. And then at blue belt in that in that sort of year of competing. Like personally for you, what was what was the, the sort of maybe the proudest moment or the biggest win that you had? Uh, Polaris, Polaris. So Polaris was like my first event because I've been competing like 
I did loads of competition before Polaroid, so like I didn't realize it was like that good because you on the TV, on the show, like loads of people watching the crown and then normally in like a normal Jiu Jitsu competition it's not like loads of people watching. So everyone is like focusing on, on his like athlete or on his mat, stuff like that. So it maybe it's like twenty people who's watching your match, stuff like that. But in Polaris it's like loads of people you like it's like you in UFC, like in the cage, it's like loads of people watching your match, like screaming, stuff like that. Yeah, it's quite good. It's a good like it's a good event. And and did did you find the audience and the people watching, did that make you feel nervous or did it did it actually excite you and make you better? Mm. In the beginning, like I was a bit nervous because it's like I want to win that competition because it's good for my career. Like I was like a bit stressed. And then when I get on the mat, I was like, oh, fuck it. So I've been doing that like every day. Why am I going to be so stressed now? Just do what, just do your thing. So I went out there like, and just do my best. How did the match go? Yeah, good. Um, was uh, by a uh, decision. So the guy was, uh, the guy is quite a tricky guy. He just like, like stuff like buggy choke, like, tricky submission. So I was like quite aware of that, of those kind of submission. So we've been working for, for him for like a couple of months. So I know I, I need to do to avoid those kind of submission and do my thing. Mm -hmm. Nice. And then you got your purple belt. Yeah, that is crazy. So that is another story. <laughs> so I didn't even realize I was like getting promoted. Like, so Normally he's gonna like lie to me like oh I'll promote you I'll give you a purple belt tomorrow I'll like do this <laughs> I'll like I'm like oh yeah yeah because for me I was trying to like just because of my visa I was trying to like go and do some stuff like euros or pan uh, at blue belt but like because uh, the lawyer say I st uh, we're gonna have loads of time here so I'm stuck here now I cannot travel for like in uh, other countries so. He thinks it's better to give me my purple belt now, then I'm going to prepare for that for the next uh, next time I can travel. So it was like in grading in our old gym, fireworks, where we used to train. So it was a, a Christmas grading there. He didn't even tell me like he's going to grade me. So I was just there like he arranged with other people. I was just there. I didn't know like someone going to grade me. And then in the end, like normally they're grading like uh, white to blue, blue to purple, stuff like that. But he went on in the end when like the great every, every, like even black belt <laughs> like so I I was knowing like yeah I'm good I'm not getting great today and then after in the end he just like oh you fucker come here <laughs> and remove my belt I was like I was so surprised like what is going on yeah that's cool yeah well, that was crazy did you get whipped no no they don't they don't whip in fireworks so. <sighs> Fucking, you got away with that, son. No. <laughs> you got away with that. We'll have to fucking get, we'll have to get him. He was there the other day, wasn't he? He just watched it. <laughs> fucking hell. <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> we'll have to plan a whipping. That's what we'll have to do. We'll have to plan a whipping. Yeah, we'll get you sooner or later, mate. <laughs> and uh, and what was your first Purple Belt uh, match like? Did you did you notice there was like a, a, a difference in, in like skill and, and competitor or did it feel the same? Yeah, it was like quite different, like because... I moved to the upper weight when I got my belt, my purple belt. I, I was lightweight, so I moved to middleweight. Yeah, it's because it was after Christmas, right? Yeah, yeah. And, I you, was quite and, you, and, and, and you're loving the UK food. <laughs> <laughs> Cavri. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and so it was, it's quite different, like, because it's people, when you purple belt, you like maybe five years of experience already. So you're not like two years of experience. So you know, like, what you need to do to win a match. So people is quite good in that division. Yeah, they're quite tough. Yeah, and um, have you done as well at, at Purple Belt as you did at Blue Belt? Or have you struggled a bit more in some we matches? We didn't compete a lot, a lot. So this year, it's not, we're not competing a, a lot like last year. Last year, I was just trying to like put my, make my name here in UK and like, like a Blue Belt and trying to compete um, as much as I can. So this year, now I'm focused on my performance. Like I, We're going to do a couple of competitions, like one per month for two like that. So obviously, one competition that you did at, purple was i think the london open right yeah. and i think that was the same competition where obviously sam suffered his pretty bad leg break and i remember obviously seeing the video and and you were obviously filming the video and i could hear you shouting so you saw something was happening i mean tell us about how it felt watching that happen uh i was like maybe 
I nearly pass out at that time <laughs> <laughs> because I never like say something like on someone I know happened like that, like break the bone, something like that. So I was just there like filming and I said to him in French, like, watch your leg. But as I was saying that, the guy reached his leg. So I was saying in French, like, watch your leg, watch your leg. As I was saying that, the guy reached his leg and then the guy was brutal, like on steroid and stuff, like massive. And then when that happened, I was like, fuck, you know, what are we going to do now? Because at that time, he just like start teaching downward flow, stuff like that. So I didn't really know what I'm gonna, what is next. So I was just like lost at that time. I didn't know what is next, what are we going to do next? And then he's supposed to travel in the morning to come home. So I was like quite lost at that time. Mm. Yeah, it was a fucking brutal injury. Yeah, it was brutal. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously... Uh you kind of mentioned that you sort of been coaching at Flow now. So obviously yourself and Sam came in, I think probably back in January now. So about sort of five months ago. Yeah. Um, obviously the, the competing obviously would have stopped a little bit as a result of the leg break as well. Um, but obviously to focus maybe a little bit on the coaching. Um, obviously there was a period as well where Sam did eventually go back to Cameroon and you were kind of coaching there for a bit by yourself. How did you, how have you found the experience at Flow and the team and, and coaching a bit more? Uh, first of all, I like the, like the area and I like like, people people there because they're not like other team where it's like group of people who is talking behind people's back so i really like enjoy being at flow like people is good people have good mindset they're like thinking good thinking about other people stuff like that and then yeah i enjoy like coaching because when you're coaching when uh, i enjoy coaching yeah teaching stuff like that because when you're teaching you like learning yourself already you're learning a- a- again even if you know the technique, you like seeing like little detail you need to adjust to make it tight, to do stuff like that. Yeah, I really enjoy teaching. Mm, yeah, it's been good having you down. And um, and kind of, uh, I guess, like the training. So obviously with Sam being injured as well, obviously that stifled your competition, but I guess he was obviously your main training partner as well, right? Yeah. So with him being injured, like, yeah, how have you found like the training sort of not having him to push you? Yeah, that affect me like so much because like, before he broke his leg, we was like pushing, pushing each other in training. So he was like, he was the only one who was like putting crazy pressure on me. So every day we was like going like, like war. Yeah, I know. I've seen it during the day. <laughs> we were fucking, it was horrible. Trying to kill each other. <laughs> but now I'm like, it's no one to like really push me like hard as like, because you know, sometimes you need someone to like submit you and like put you in bad position, amber, stuff like that. So he was doing that on me, like put me in brutal ambas. Like he was going like a war. Like I trying to kill him, you trying to kill me, stuff like that. And then that's how I'm, my pe- my performance was like, go, like I was like getting good and good and good because I was like every day in pressure. So now if I when I get in competition, like they're not gonna be able to put same pressure as Sam on me. Like they're not gonna be able to put the same pressure on me because I'm used to the pressure already. So he's not gonna be able to like, like put me in like bad position because I'm used to those positions. I guess one advantage is obviously when he does start training and sparring again, he's going to be a bit unfit in a bit of a way and you've got a good opportunity there to get some payback, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm looking for I'm You're looking gonna for You're going to remember all those it. years. Yeah, yeah. But he's, <laughs> he's like focused now on like lifting weight. So he's going to like, before he was like literally same weight, I was like 83, he was 83, something like that. Yeah, now he's like, uh, like something like, 10 kilo on top of me so it's <laughs> gonna be hard to- <laughs> yeah you better forget better, better get in those carburies yeah. mate <laughs> and then i guess like you know sort of thinking forward so you know get this sort of uh, the, the sort of immigration stuff and the visa and everything else squared away and done and then suddenly like the world's opened up to you again right so thinking forward to when you can travel and when you can compete <clears throat> on these bigger shows what is like your aspiration with jiu-jitsu what do you want to try and achieve in jiu-jitsu? Uh, my going in jiu-jitsu, like, now I'm not able to travel, so that's why now I don't want to compete much. So that's why I'm focused on my performance now to, like, to be ready when I'm going to be able to travel, then I'm going to go out there and show everyone what I can do, like, do worlds, euros, brasileiro, stuff like that. That's why now I'm, like, so focused on my performance, mm-hmm. not competing, focus on my are you performance. Gonna do, are you going to focus on gi or no gi, or have you not thought of that you're going to do both? Mm, I really enjoy doing both, really. Like, I like gi, I like no gi. So, if like someone like phone me and say, oh, we have a match, like, we have a super fight, mm-hmm. up, uh, like, for me, it doesn't matter if it's gi or no gi, yeah, yeah. I'll take a fight. 
So I'm not like especially like saying no, I'll just do gi or no gi. So I'm focused on both. So if you could name like like one competition to win, like what's what's like the what's like the if you think about the absolute best thing that could happen in jiu-jitsu for you, what would that be? World champion black belt. Yeah. Absolute. ADCC or ABJJF? ADCC is kind of good issue, like just looking forward for the money and like stuff like that. Like for me, I don't want to like be so famous. Like I just want to do what I like and go out there and do good jiu-jitsu. Like if I'm going on ADCC, yeah, I'll do ADCC or IBJJF. For me, it doesn't matter. Both is really good. I guess the advantage you've got with obviously ADCC is you don't need to be a black belt. Yeah, to be world to, champion, to be world theory, champion you? Yeah. you know you can do That's the trials matter, you yeah. get in and do that so that could be cool mate well I think you've definitely got the, the talent and the potential mate to potentially win the ADCC and the RBGF Worlds yeah man. he was ridiculously good mate for 18 <laughs> it's fucking scary everyone listening this boy is fucking scary for yeah, 18 he's coming for you <laughs> but, but that's the thing I think the fact you're so young and already obviously so good um, and you've obviously got that mindset as well I think coming from Cameroon so wish you all the best mate um, thank you obviously you've had a fair bit of support obviously Scramble have been a massive help to you um, nice hoodie by the way thank you yeah you can find that on the website nice um and obviously sam is family and lots of people i think in the jiu-jitsu community have rallied and got behind you um do you want to kind of give anybody a shout out or say thanks to anybody yeah thanks first of all to scrambo matt and ben thanks to sam too thanks to everyday podcast to for having me on their podcast thank you to flow martial art fire academy and check my Faison. amazing Awesome. Thanks for coming on, brother. Thank you. Cheers, Frank. Thank Cheers. you, mate.